Okay, and welcome everyone to this session of the Media Education Labs AI in the Classroom series. I hope you all were able to join our 20th anniversary celebration yesterday. It was a great event and we've got our new website out, lots of things to catch up on. So as we go through today's conversation, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're calling in from. Um, feel free to use it as a way to ask questions or participate in the discussion as well. You can also use the raise hand function and we'll welcome you to join on camera and off mute during the interactive portions as well. Uh, in this session, we're going to be learning about uh, introducing students in K through 12 spheres to AI. Brittany Aubin is our guide for the discussion. She's a technical advisor for educational technology at IREX, the International Research and Exchanges Board. Uh, an international nonprofit specializing in global education and development, which admittedly is where I work as well in my day job. So she has spent the last decade working in online education and is passionate about the use of technology to accelerate learning. Uh, Brittany, I'll hand it over to you now. Please take it away. Thanks, Jocelyn. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you all virtually. Um, as Jocelyn said, my name is Brittany. Um, I'm based in Nyack, New York, um, and I have been working in um, online education and ed tech for uh, over a decade now. I um, actually got my start um, in education uh, in the Peace Corps in Zambia, where I was doing interactive radio instruction uh, and just haven't, haven't stopped since. Um, and so I'm really excited to talk to you all today. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I will warn everyone, I know this is like a lunchtime session for those of us on, on the East Coast, this is going to be interactive. Um, so I have about 10 slides to go through. And then after that, um, we will go into breakout rooms. Um, I really think that one of the best ways to learn about AI um, is to really get your hands dirty and to kind of explore it um, and also to think about um, what other people are doing with it and share what you're doing with it. And so um, that will be kind of the purpose of um, a big bulk of today's uh, conversation. So without further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, and Josh, I'll just ask for a thumbs up if you could see that. Looks good. Okay, great. Let me move my little Zoom. All right. Um, so to start with, um, because we're all coming off of the holidays and we're in this uh, sprint to the end of the year. Um, let's start with a little fun icebreaker. So if you can just indicate in the chat, uh, which dog reflects your mood today? Um, I think I'm a little bit of number two because um, uh, I'm feeling like, oh, it's a, it's a presentation with people that I haven't met before. Um, but I think uh, maybe it's a combination of two and eight because uh, I'm also very excited to, this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, so if you can just share in the chat, which of these uh, dogs represents you? And if you want to also share why that is, uh, you'll feel free to add that um, information to the chat as well. Um, and I can't see the chat, so I won't be able to uh, give any banter around that, but I hope that encourages you to think about dogs and uh, have a little bit of metacognitive moment about where you're feeling going into the final sprint of the year. All right. Uh, my background is in learning design, um, and so any learning designer um, worth their stuff is going to um, start any conversation um, with learning objectives. Um, so here are some objectives for today's conversation. Um, again, some of these are going to be collaboratively um, constructed together. Um, so first, talking a little bit about the impact of transformative technology on education. Uh, so we're going to do like a real like kind of like a time capsule back uh, to uh, the, B the 440 BC. Um, so we prepared for that. Uh, then we're going to talk about some key considerations for the use of generative AI in K-12 education. Uh, then we're going to collectively compile a list of use cases for generative AI in K-12 classrooms. Um, and then finally, because this is um, a topic where uh, you can spend an entire 40-hour uh, work week just trying to learn about generative AI in, in the classroom and still not even kind of like scratch the surface of all the resources that are out there, um, identifying some of the kind of high quality resources that I've used um, to build some of my own skill sets around AI. All right. 
So first, let's start with um, our, our time capsule experience. So let's go back to 400 BC. Um, so at that point, Socrates was one of the predominant teachers um, and the written word had just come out. Um, before that, everything was kind of learned via, via communication, via speaking, right? There was no written word to uh, kind of document thought. And Socrates was really distrustful of the written word and he uh, considered it a really poor substitute for genuine human interaction. Uh, and he thought it was gonna be a threat to the development of true wisdom and knowledge, really thought this was gonna destroy uh, you know, education as we knew it at that time. Um, then we're going to jump forward uh, to 1440 AD uh, when Johannes Gutenberg created a printing press. And so at that point, uh, the education system was basically one where professors just read out loud from books and students sat around and listened to professors reading out loud. And there was this real fear when books became readily accessible that uh, it would destroy the education system as we knew it, um, because if people had access to readily available books, why on earth would they, uh, you know, go to classes with a, with a teacher, right? Um, and so, again, this idea that books were going to be um, a threat to the development of true wisdom and knowledge. Okay, let's take our, our time cap, our time machine really, really forward. Um, so now we're going to go to the mid 1970s, um, and we're going to look at the calculator, right? And so. American teachers were very skeptical um, when calculators came out and became mainstream um, because they thought that when students were utilizing calculators that they weren't going to be able to see the errors in their thinking, um, which is, I think is a very familiar line um, for those of us who are following the debate these days. Um, and parents really, really thought that, you know, if their kids had calculators, they weren't going to spend the time learning math. Um, so again, we saw that there was this belief that a new technology was going to really destroy, um, you know, the ability for people to gain wisdom and knowledge. Which brings us uh, to uh, the topic for today, which is generative AI. Um, and so Thomas Friedman has called generative AI the Promethean moment, right? The moment of really um, a, a humans achieving fire. Um, and um, we know that uh, generative uh, ChatGPT just celebrated its one year birthday, right? So um, about a year ago, we were all kind of sitting in our desks and being like, what is this new chat GPT thing, right? Um, and uh, the dust in, in the course of a year, the dust has not settled, right? As we know from what happened at OpenAI just last week, um, you know, there's still kind of lots of confusion about the future of this new technology. Um, but we do know that much of the discourse that, um, that has come out within the last 12 months has been around um, concerns about plagiarism, concerns about cheating, and concerns that uh, these computerized tutors um, could um, in some way um, replace teachers. And once again, um, this is a threat to the development of true wisdom and knowledge. So I think it's a good point uh, to think about Amara's Law. Um, and I've heard this uh, mentioned in, in, in a few different um, spaces, um, talking about generative AI. Um, so Amara, Roy Amara was a futurist. Um, he came up with this uh, you know, kind of law that's named after him, um, called Amara's Law, that, that we tend to overestimate the impact of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect of a technology in the long run. Um, and so I think that this law really holds true when we think about those innovations that we, just, that we just discussed. So at each and every juncture, society has been skeptical about uh, a new technology in the way that it's going to impact the education system. And there's always this fear that a new technology is going to uh, destroy, disrupt, revolutionize um, in the short term um, in a really kind of detrimental way. Uh, education as we know it, learning as we know it. Um, and we know from looking at, you know, the written word, books, calculators, uh, in the short term, these things did not destroy education. But if you look at the long arc of history, they did have a revolutionary effect on the teaching and the learning process. Um, and so that's, I think, an important um, law to think about when we think about what the long term impact of generative AI will be. Because where we're at right now, it's only been a year. We don't we don't know, um, but we do know that lots of folks have hypothesized what they think um, the impact will be. And you know, you can kind of look up some of the leading thinkers in the education space and the technology space uh, about where we see uh, generative AI taking us in the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, 
one of the leading thinkers um, that I, I follow, who I think is a great follow, if you haven't heard of him before, Michael Feldstein of Illiterate, um, that's his blog. Um, he came out with this um, statement, which I thought was really great. Um, and I would love to see this being um, how, uh, how generally I and ends up impacting uh, education. And I'm just going to read it, uh, though I, I don't like reading long quotes on slides, but I think this is a very powerful one. So LLMs or large language models are like 3D printers for knowledge work. They shift human labor from execution to design, from making to creating, from knowing more answers to asking better questions. We assume that masses of people will become useless as well education because we have trouble imagining an education system that teaches people, all people from all social economic strata to become better thinkers rather than, simple, than simply better knowers and doers. Um, so again, he is a really powerful hypothesis for what we can think of um, happening um, in the education system as uh, you know, tools like generative AI become more mainstream and more utilized. Uh, we also know, and I know that this is a group that has had lots of conversations about this, um, that from an education educator's perspective, there are things that both uh, teachers and learners will need to kind of incorporate into their curriculum in order to make this, um, you know, this vision that Michael Feldstein and many others have um, put out there a reality. Um, and so one of them is digital literacy, right? Embedding um, into lessons and into curriculum, both for teachers and for learners, um, what LLMs are, how they are trained, and then how they use and store personal data. Whoops. We also know that another lesson that we want to um, think about embedding within curriculums is this idea of epistemic knowledge, right? So what is considered knowledge? Um, how did it come to be knowledge? Um, and what are ways that we can discern legitimacy, right? So how can we know what is actually real? Um, and then finally, this is a personal, um, a personal love of mine, metacognition. Um, so um, we really, especially for learners, we want them to understand the role of generative AI in the learning process. Um, they need to be able to understand the gaps in their existing knowledge and skills, and they need to know how to close them, right? Um, so these three components um, are really necessary um, to pair with generative AI in a curriculum um, to make sure that both the teachers and the learners are able to um, use these tools um, in a way that is safe um, and also effective. There's a really wonderful quote um, from the, the head of EdTech Hub, which is another great organization um, to follow if you work in digital development, um, which, is, which is where I um, spend my days these days. Um, so um, she says that people either have non-specific pessimism or uncritical optimism when it comes to EdTech. Um, and so I am definitely a techno optimist, but I am not an uncritical techno optimist. Um, so um, I think it's really important when we think about the immense potential that generative AI offers, that we also um, understand that there are downfalls um, and, or downsides and pitfalls um, when, um, when utilizing these tools. Um, I'm not going to talk about the ones that I think have been covered very extensively in the media. Um, so we all know that there's bias in the systems. We all know that there are um, you know, issues with data, data privacy and data security, especially when we think about young people. Um, I think we also all know that right now we are all kind of using these free tools um, that could switch to being paid versions um, at any moment. Um, and so um, I think those have been really, I think, very heavily covered. Um, when we think about the pedagogical uh, potential uh, risks with these tools, some of the, the three main ones that, that I think about are cognitive offloading. So cognitive offloading is this um, concept that um, when your brain has another way of um, kind of storing or keeping or doing um, the, the thought process, it will offload that work to whatever the, that other thing is. Um, and so we saw this happening um, when we all got navigation systems in our pocket, right? Um, so as you know, all of our cell phones now, um, for the most part, offer GPS, right? And as that has happened as a society, we have become um, much less able to navigate on our own. And that, that process is called cognitive offloading. Um, and there's a fear, and it's a valid one, um, that with the rise of large language models, um, there is a possibility that we will cognitive offload um, some skills related to, to writing um, as well. Uh, the other one, this one does, I think, get quite a lot of coverage, but I think it's a really important one to talk about when we're talking about the K-12 population, um, is this idea of um, unknowns and inaccuracies. Um, and so we know that um, these large language models, we don't know what 
what they they know and don't know. They're essentially black boxes to us. Um, and we know that the the, tra the training data that they've been um, kind of trained on does have bias in the system, but there's un there's it's unclear to us how to kind of address that um, because we don't know what they know. Um, and we also know that they have a strong tendency to just uh, tell us an answer rather than saying, I don't know. Um, so if you put something in chat GPT, it's very unlikely it's gonna tell you, I don't know. Um, we know that there has been um, progress around that. And so uh, the, um, you know, the, main, the main models are, are starting to be better at saying, I don't know. Um, but it's still not consistent, and especially with the with the free versions, um, they are pretty pretty um, likely to just tell you something, even if they if that information isn't actually true. And it's because they don't they don't know right from wrong, they don't know true from false. They just predict the next likely word based on their training data. So they really don't even have the ability to be able to do that. Um, and so I think when we think about the K to twelve audience, um, it's really important that we we kind of keep that front and center. The idea that there are even the best possible models have a range of any from three to 10% of the content that is going to be hallucinated or made up. Um, and then this last one, uh, as someone who comes from a learning science background, um, is very, very important to me. And it's the idea of um, shifting away from proven pedagogy. Um, and so all of the learning science in the last decades have shown that the best way to learn is um, through um, this thing called desirable difficulties. And so if there's educators in the room, which I think there are, there are many educators here, um, we all know that um, productive struggle is important um, to um, the being able to actually transfer information into long-term memory and to be able to recall it and use it in the future. Um, now, Large language models, ChatGPT is about instant gratification. It is not about desirable difficulties. Um, and so when we think about incorporating generative AI into the classroom, we wanna think about how we could um, make sure to be adding in desirable difficulties um, as part of that. Um, I think the other um, kind of shift away from proven pedagogy is the fact that when you look at a large language model or ChatGPT or um, you know any of these kind of AI powered tools, they're really excellent at uh, content creation. So they can generate copious amounts of information um, at record speeds. Uh, and it's very tempting as an instructor um, to lean on that copious amount of information um, as opposed to incorporating more student-led problem-based um, approaches that, um, that we know um, are more associated with higher learning outcomes. Um, and so I think that when we think about um, you know, the big risks um, for generative AI, particularly looking at the K-12 classroom, these are three ones that are three that are like very much um, you know, top of mind for me. So I want to now get your opinions about these things. Um, and so I'm going to set us up in a Miro activity. Um, and I see that there's some chats. I mean, before, um, before we hop into Miro, I'm gonna look at these chats and see if there's anything here that, okay, lots of numbers. Okay, good. Um, okay. so. Hopefully people have used Miro before. If you haven't used Miro, um, one of the things that I love about Miro is that it is incredibly intuitive. Um, so I'm gonna give the instructions and then we're gonna, Jocelyn is gonna shepherd us off into breakout rooms. There'll be three rooms um, and let's click into the Miro board now. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, and I think Jocelyn is gonna put the, the link to the Miro board in the chat. Um, and so I will zoom in first on these instructions so we can kind of talk through what we're going to do next. Um, also, I think I mentioned when we started that I'm from New York. Uh, I definitely talk like a New Yorker. So hopefully everyone is able to follow my very, my, my very fast pace. Um, I apologize about that. Um, so basically what we're going to do is a little um, kind of collaborative generative activity, right? Um, and so for those of us who are educators, um, you know, feel free to use examples from your own experience. Um, if you are not an educator, but you work within the education related space, or you just have some ideas about how ChatGPT can be used, um, these don't have to be ideas that you've used in the past. And they could be things that you've heard about in you know, your own reading, um, or just something that you think would be interesting. Um, so we are going to um, have each group start with a different board. So if you are group one and you'll see it in your, um, when you go into breakout rooms, you'll see in the very top, it'll tell you what group you're in. So if you're a group one, you're gonna start here on how do educators use AI to build knowledge, right? Um, so what are some of the many ways that educators can use uh, generative AI 
to build knowledge among their students. And that could be um, you know, either doing student-directed tasks or educators using um, AI to build their own knowledge. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna grab a sticky note, you just click on it with your, with your clicker and move it here. You can make it bigger if you want. You can also make your whole screen bigger if you want to just um, you know, zoom in a little bit closer. And then when you click on your sticky note, you can write your, your response. Um, so if you are group one, we're gonna spend six minutes and I'll put a timer um, on, um, I'll put a timer on the mural board for six minutes so that we know how much time we have. So group one spends six minutes on this first, uh, this first uh, prompt here. If you are group two, you're going to spend six minutes on this prompt here. So how can educators use AI to incorporate practice? Um, so what are some of the ways that educators um, can use generative AI to incorporate practice activities for their students? Um, or the ways that students can use it- Excuse uh, me for interrupting. In practice themselves. Yep. Hello? Yep, I can hear you, Brittany? Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I went to it, even though I've used it before, uh, when I went to it now, it re was requiring me to create an account to sign in and to create an account since apparently I don't have an account. So was that the, a setting that you can make it public or something? It Otherwise should... it's gonna take us longer to get there. Yeah, Jocelyn, did it make you take a, do an account? It should allow you to exit out of that option and just do it as a visitor. I didn't see that option, but I'll try again. Let's see. Okay. Maybe, yeah, it looks like maybe I'm there now. Okay. Sorry. Okay. No worries. Um, yeah, if there's anything with Mira, let me know. And hopefully if we're, we're in groups, if there's one person who can't get in, um, people can, can scribe for that person. Um, and the last one, I think I mentioned, this is a, a, a personal, um, you know, hobby horse of mine, um, but metacognition. So how can we think about utilizing generative AI um, to um, help students to both um, prime them for uh, the learning process and also post-process for, for the learning process as well? Um, so I'm going to I'm going to have Jocelyn send us all off into breakout rooms. Um, every six minutes, your group will switch. So if you're a group one, start with this first frame. Um, then after six minutes, you're going to switch to the second one. And then after six minutes, you'll switch to the third. Um, when you go to the next one, you can spend a few minutes, like look or a minute, just looking at what's already there. But then um, you know, add your own your own ideas as well. So uh, when you get to the third board, there should be a lot of ideas already there. That's going to force your mind to be a little bit more creative in terms of what you think about, and you can also react to the the ideas that you've already seen there. Um, and so group one will start with this first one, group two will start with the second one, and group three will start with the third one, and then rotate clockwise um, every six minutes. Any questions about that? I see one in the chat about knowing which group you're in. It should show you at the top of your screen once you're in the breakout rooms. Yeah, the, the breakout rooms which should, should show you. And we'll hop through and make sure that there's no troubles as well. All right, opening all rooms now. Nancy, Gretchen, and Doni, are you having any trouble joining rooms? If any of the three of you are speaking, you are on mute, so we can't hear you, but please do come off mute or drop us a note in the chat if you're having trouble. Otherwise, we'll Leave you there. All right. Brittany, I believe you should be able to hop through as a co-host. Okay, good. 
Right. It looks like most folks have started and are puttering around the Miro board. Okay. I'm going to give them a minute to introduce themselves and then I'll yes. Hey, Sarah, we actually just started breakout rooms, so you joined at a good time. I'll put you into one right now.
How's it going, Brittany? Good. I think that everyone has switched. Great. I'm going to try to look at what some of the people are saying. Oh, yeah, quite a lot of post it notes. I love that you can add a timer to mirror board too, that it goes off actually. Yeah, you would add timer um, and you could also add emojis to people's um, to people, people's post-its. Um, right. And there's also ways to incorporate like voting. It's a, it's a really great tool. Yeah. I think we have one, one more um, five minute block after this. Yep, that sounds right to me. There's so many good post-its on here. I don't know how we're gonna cover all of them. I don't think we will be able to. All right, it looks like everyone is back. Um, yeah, so hopefully people enjoy that activity. Um, again, um, I think I mentioned one of the breakout rooms, uh, the divisions are were a little fuzzy, right? There are things that can be both metacognitive but also building knowledge and, you know, they, they can kind of, uh, kind of span multiple different kind of instructional components. Um, but I do feel that sometimes instead of just saying, well, how can we use AI in the classroom, adding some types of restrictions can be a little bit helpful um, in the idea generation process. Um, so yeah, if we can just spend some time, I'd love maybe uh, if each group can just go around and say like what, the, what maybe there was there was something that was like super interesting in terms of ways to use ChatGPT or generative AI that you haven't heard of before. Um, so anyone from group one want to share uh, any insights or takeaways that they had? I still see that there's some some little um, arrows uh, floating around the mirror. So people will be able to access this afterwards as well as the public link. Well, we raised a lot of questions in the group one, uh, uh, including, well, using of the tools, uh, English teaching um, a special issue with AI, uh, concerns about uh, 
ethical use uh, when it is up to the using certain tools and uh, uh, about uh, uh, maybe the better biggest and and the huge influence on the producing um, fake news and the need for the media literacy focusing on uh, uh, AI uh, especially and mostly. Yeah, yeah, I think that one, um, I think I was just reading this morning about how, uh, you know, SEO is basically just um, really just pulling from AI generated, um, AI generated articles now. Um, and so it's really changing the way that we use search engines um, or will be. Anyone from, from group two want to share what they big takeaways from their conversations? I just want to say that I appreciated how this particular activity focused on the positives um, uses because we spend a lot of time and I know I do thinking about the challenges. Um, so I'm still reading, but I, I love that the questions and the prompts pushed us to think of, of positive uses. Uh, definitely an optimist over here, um, but yeah, we do need to have we do need to have um, a critical lens. Um, and I think there's also um, there's a, a really interesting study from McKinsey on ed tech in general, um, and um, it's, it's it's kind of at a global scale, but it talks about how um, the the most effective uses of ed tech are when a teacher is using it alone and not the students, um, and the worst outcomes of ed tech are when students are using alone without a teacher. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that when we think about generative AI, in a lot of ways, it's about how can teachers use it to make their lives easier um, and make their learning outcomes, um, you know, improve their learning outcomes. Um, and not so much of like, you know, let's just give kids, you know, tablets with chat GPT on it and, and they'll be able to teach themselves them in, in a safe and effective way. And I can share um, that McKinsey article. Um, it's one that I cite quite a lot. Um, it's a little dated, um, but let me put it in the chat. Um, and in group three, anything that you'd like to share? Oh, that came in weird, sorry, one second. Anyone from group three have, have any big takeaways? Yep. You know, just, I was kind of uh, excited about the fact that people had lots of ideas uh, jumping in there, lots of good ideas. Um, so one of the areas that we're focusing on um, for metacognition is feedback looking about how to use these systems to provide feedback. And uh, so that's, we're seeing a lot of good research coming up from that. Yeah, and one of the, um, you know, one of the um, the ways I've seen it be used or seen it being recommended is kind of first pass feedback. Um, and so not necessarily that you're going to, you know, put a student's essay into chat GPT and say, give me feedback on this and then give that directly to the student, but kind of using it as a way to say like, here's a rubric, um, you know, can you give feedback on this based on this rubric? And then using that as kind of like a, a stepping stone to remove some of the administrative work. Um, you know, OpenAI just, um, if you have a paid account, just came out with these um, GPTs, which is not the great, not the best name, but you can actually program your own chat GPT. Um, and so if you are an instructor, there's lots of um, kind of instructional use cases um, for, you know, kind of coming up with a, a your own personal GPT that could um, you know help you with the um, kind of that first pass feedback. I played around with GPTs, it's very fun, um, but um, it does as of right now um, require a paid account and, and, and uh, OpenAI has kind of shut those down for the time being. So I saw a lot of really great um, responses on the Miro board, um, lots of that were new to me. I think the, the big takeaway um, and, and hopefully something that um, people gain from, from those conversations um, is that like there, there are infinite ways to use this tool, right? Um, so people have to compare generate AI to electricity. Um, on its own, it's like interesting, but not that you know, not that useful. But when you think about um, using it to power different things um, and to generate different types of ideas, um, 
it, it becomes like really game changing, right? Um, and so the best way to think about how to use generative AI in the classroom is just to explore different prompts, um, to learn about how other people are utilizing it. And again, always remembering those guardrails around, um, you know, ed tech is best when it's utilized by, by educators um, or utilized by, by students with a lot of educator oversight. Um, and again, that depends on the type of students that you're working with. And, and we also need to make sure we keep in mind those big considerations that we already discussed um, in terms of um, in terms of data um, and uh, bias. So I just have one little slide here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again uh, to this summarizes some of the use cases. Um, this was from before, um, obviously the mirror activity. So these are my predictions of some things that might come up. Um, so uh, we'll see if they're uh, they're accurate. Um, so a, a big um, way to use these types of tools is to to encourage problem based learning. Um, so I mentioned before that um, you know the there's a danger with uh, generative AI to move back to Sage on a stage, which we know is a less effective way of of, of teaching and learning. Um, and so. Um, the flip side of that would be to utilize, um, you know, tools like ChatGPT um, in terms of problem-based learning. And there's like many, many great examples um, that you can access, um, you know, via the web of ways, um, you know, faculty have you or teachers have used uh, ChatGPT for things like hackathons with students um, to be able to help them kind of come up with like problem-based solution, uh, problem-based activities for their classrooms. Um, Similarly, um, you know, thinking about um, ways to foster curiosity, right? Um, you know, I have a, a almost two-year-old who is like endlessly curious, um, and I think the curiosity he, um, you know, shows in a world he has constant questions, and I think that sometimes, like as a, uh, he doesn't fully have questions yet because he doesn't really fully talk yet, but I can tell he has questions. Um, but, um, you know, as a parent, as an educator, um, we only have so much time, sometimes like limited bandwidth to encourage um, that self-directed learning. And I think that that's a, an area where, um, you know, these tools, um, if them, if we think about um, utilizing them with the right guardrails, um, there's a lot of talk about having kind of like a walled garden. Um, and when you think about um, the um, use of generative AI with especially young children, um, there are lots of ways we can kind of encourage creativity, which our curiosity, which we know is so essential to um, the learning process. Um, lots of talk about utilizing generative AI for adaptive tutoring. Um, so, um, you know, Benjamin Bloom um, talked about the two sigma problem um, in terms of the difference that one-on-one -on -one tutoring provides um, for instruction. Um, we know that it is the most effective way um, to learn is via one-on-one -on -one tutoring, but we also know that it is impossible to scale one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Uh, and so there's been, I think, lots of talk um, about um, how we can use generative AI um, to kind of get a step in that direction. Um, um, I think the the big uh, the big leader there is Khan Academy and what they've been doing with Khan Minga O is um, a great example. Um, and then there's also been a lot of discussion around um, accessibility, right? And for, um, you know, for, for learners who, um, you know, face um, things like dyslexia, what it could mean to have a tool that can allow them to more easily, um, you know, communicate via the written word um, and what that could look like. Jeffrey, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, um, you know, I was impressed by Khan Academy's stuff. I watched a demo. Uh, and one thing that really uh, caught my attention was they had a huge number of subjects that they were using uh, the tool with, the using generative AI to do coaching. And I was just wondering if you know anything about, they must have developed a process to reproduce that. So if they wanted to add another subject area I'm guessing that it would probably be relatively simple. Uh, any insights into that process or how difficult that would be? We, I'm interested in talking to them about a specific topic area that using their technology. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how. They, I, I I wish um, I had that level of insight, um, but I don't know exactly how they how they. Um, I know they programmed their own version of ChatGPT four, um, and so the. The coming up with the, and I think if you if you play around with making your own GPT, um, I think you'll realize this as well. Like coming up with the initial kind of like parameters um, for for these types of tools is the hardest part. And then once you kind of have the parameters, it's easy to kind of feed it training data and then you know have it have it kind of work um, on that data. Um, I will say one of the resources that I'm going to show on the next slide is actually a um, AI 101 course um, that is um, kind of co-produced by. Khan Economy and code.org, as well as ETS and um, ISTE. Um, and so you might want to check out that. Um, they have, they kind of go into the weeds. 
Um, and then the other um, the other resource here um, that I think, especially we've talked about um, some of the um, you know the ethical concerns. Uh, Common Sense Media, which is the organization that kind of brings you um, kind of like those parental, um, you know, kind of warning labels, has come up with a um, AI um, product review and um, rating guide. So if you were, so if we were talking about Conmingo, it's, a, it's relevant. If you were to click into, um, they've only done a few so far, but they're the major players. Um, they will actually tell you kind of like an overall rating, a privacy rating, um, and then um, limitations lights, harms, and ethical risk. Um, and then they have their, their kind of principles, um, you know, as a rubric that they're utilizing for this rating system. Um, and so if you're an educator and you're thinking about utilizing one of these tools within the classroom, I would recommend checking out Common Sense Media's page um, to see if the, the tool that you want to use is there and um, kind of going over, especially, um, you know, the harms, limitations, and misuses um, components of it. Okay, and then finally, I want to just end with some resources um, in addition to what I the content that I showed you. Um, so starting with uh, the OG, um, so OpenAI has a really helpful guide for educators who are utilizing ChatGPT. It comes with an FAQ um, and um, you know, they're constantly updating it. And it also includes lots of really helpful prompts. So if you want to just kind of get a head start with them prompts, um, you know, it's a great place to, to look. Um, I just mentioned this one, um, AI 101 for Teachers. Um, it's a five-part series of webinars um, that's been produced by um, Khan Economy, Code.org, ETS, and I, um, ISTE. Um, and it has some really relevant content and kind of moves from, you know, basic understanding to like really how to go about implementing, um, you know, these tools within the classroom. Um, if folks um, are not reading um, Ethan Malik, um, I definitely recommend that you start. Um, I found his one useful thing newsletter to be incredibly helpful in kind of building out a skill set um, within within AI. Um, it has more than one useful thing in every in every um, in every newsletter, and he's also um, consulted with OpenAI um, on their teachers guide as well. Um, and then finally, if you're an educator who uses Canva as part of your kind of educational suite, they just rolled out um, a whole kind of um, batch of tools uh, that can help you uh, to build lesson plans, um, do accessibility checks, um, all types of um, you know, resources that can kind of um, aid in, it, in, in the instructional process. Um, and then finally, if you want more of the resources from this presentation, um, they're all available here, um, I put together this, um, you know, this page to serve as a kind of landing page for my organization um, in terms of getting up to speed on ChatGPT. Um, and so um, you can definitely, I'll put this link in the chat as well, um, check this out. And all the links that I mentioned today, as well as, um, you know, the content is, is available here. Stop sharing. Thank you so much for, for spending your lunch hour with me um, for those who are East Coast based. Um, I don't know if there are any questions or comments and otherwise we can we can wrap up. Uh, so, so so those resources you just ran through, um, I was trying to note them, but are will you make your slides available so we can click on those links? Yes, I can I can send out the slides. I'll send them to Jocelyn. Great. And then like the very last thing you showed. It was like trying to write down the URL, but I didn't make it. So thank you for those. Yeah, I just put that last one in the in the chat. Thank okay. you so much, everyone. Hearing no other comments, I will wrap us up. Thank you so much, Brittany, and to all of our participants. I always love seeing new names and our, our regular names pop into the chat and online. This is our last AI session for 2023, but thanks to all of the positive feedback we've been getting from all of you, we have decided to keep going in 2024. So there will be more educational resources, more of these types of sessions on AI in education. So if you've got more feedback or you have ideas that you want us to cover that we haven't done yet, please do send us an email. And of course, please check out our brand new website too, which is super beautiful. I will put the link to that as well as my email into the chat. And then we will wrap up for the day. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And have a good rest of your day, wherever you are. Bye. Bye, everyone.